Hello, everyone. Here we are at the Mosaic Arts Online Studio, and I am so honored to be chatting today with the one and only Rachel Davies. <laughs> All the way right. in Scotland. Oh, it's just, it feels like everyone's getting farther and farther away. It's just crazy. But it's just so awesome that with our cyber technologies and the help of, of course, Jerry the Wizard behind the scenes, we're able to do this today. And I am so excited. So you are all here because you're excited to hear from Rachel and her journey of becoming a mosaic artist, a professional one, how much she loves to work with Slate. And at the very end, you are gonna get a very exciting bonus gift as we are launching her course right now. So stay tuned. Um, there's going to be some really exciting things happening coming up. So without further ado, everyone in the chat, please say hello and where you're from. And I know more and more people are gonna be joining. I know it's harder and harder to not have, you know, the 300s that used to join us because we're all out and about. We know it's a work day for some people. It's the evening for Rachel in the UK or in Scotland. And um, so we appreciate anyone that does get on. Obviously, you know, you can subscribe to our channel for the YouTube and that you can see any and all of our, um, any and all of our, uh, YouTube presentations that we've had over the years. So we're hopefully gonna have no technological glitches, but if we do stick with us, cause we can always recover and come back. So on that note, I just wanna say welcome, Rachel. Hi, thank you for having me here, Tammy. It's been really, really good to be working with you and yeah, looking forward to chatting this evening. Yes, and Rachel uh, shot her course remotely in Scotland because obviously there was no way for me to get there or her to come here to the studio in California. So to get started, Rachel, I wanted to ask, because I'm sure many people want to know how you even got started in mosaic art and do you have an art background? Okay, so yeah, I, I started, um, I actually lived in the States uh, for a few years um, and it was when I was in the States that I... Um, I went to a mosaic uh, mosaic exhibition um, and so I was inspired by all the mosaics that I saw there. I'd often kind of admired mosaic art, but that exhibition, I kind of saw all the more textural stuff, you know, sort of the ungrouted things with small tea and things like that. So, um, so yeah, that really inspired me to, to have a go. Um, so, yeah, I kind of bought some bits and pieces and started, you know, sort of making um, and just was doing it as a hobby for, um, you know, for a few years while I was in the States. Um, right. And yeah, I took some some classes um, while I was there. Um, and yeah, just try tried different things, you know, working with glass and, and you know, recycled China and, you know, until, until I kind of found what, what I wanted to, to work with. Um, that, I mean, that's kind of the beauty of mosaic art. You know, once you're a painter, your choices are paint. When you work <laughs> in mosaic art, all of a sudden it's glass, china, tile, you know, the list goes yeah. on and on, slate, as we know. So it's it's kind of a beautiful thing. And I know we're sort of this, you know, medium that people can't quite figure out. Are we fine art? Are we craft? And that is a whole other conversation for an, yeah, yeah. another day. <laughs> we're not going there. But anyway, so when did you realize, I know you took a workshop here in Santa Barbara and we actually got to meet and hang out that weekend many yeah. moons ago, which was so awesome with Rachel Sager. Um, yeah, yeah. But when did you realize though that you could take this on professionally and be seen as a professional artist? Because I know there's many people, including myself way back in the day that had a hard time identifying myself as a professional artist. Yeah, so I mean, when, when I moved back so we were in the States for us, so that's when I was kind of, you know, doing it as a hobby. And then when we moved back um, to Scotland, um, I was then, like, I'd been a stay-at-home mum for like 10 years before we moved back. Mm -hmm. um, and prior to that, I was a clinical psychologist. Um, so when we came back, you know, the kids were all old enough that I was like, right, I need to now look at what I'm going to do career-wise. You know, am I going to go back to doing psychology or do I want to kind of try the art thing? So... Um, I really enjoyed doing the art as a hobby, so I wanted to kind of give that a go um, and see whether I could, you know, if people were interested in my work, if they wanted to buy my work, you know, um, and it, it just gave me that flexibility as well, um, you know, around the kids and things rather than, you know, trying to find a, you know, a job. 
Um, so yeah, so that's when I, I kind of picked or we'll, we'll go down that the art route and see see how that goes. Um, and so yeah, just gradually built that up. Um, I'm not sure at what point I decided I was professional because I think that, mm. like you said, that's that's a really difficult thing to, um, you know, I, I remember, you know, when, when there was a period, you know, when people asked me what I did, I'm like, oh, I'm an artist. And that felt really strange, kind of calling myself an artist. I was like, I haven't been at art school. I haven't, you know, I've just, you know, I've taken some classes, you know, I've, I've, I've developed my skills, but, you know, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I haven't done like a degree or anything like that in, in art. So it's just something I've kind of dabbled in and looked at. Right. And so. Yeah, it's when it goes from dabble to serious. And I remember when I was switching gears from the movie industry to doing this and my sister would introduce me as a costumer and I'd be like, no, I'm an artist. You know, <laughs> I just have to do this costuming thing right now to pay the bills. Yeah. So you really want to identify when you start like, you know, putting your grit into it. You're like, wait, I get paid for this a little bit. Can I be professional? <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, if you're getting paid for it, it's, it's a profession, then you're a professional. Exactly. When you start paying taxes because of it, you're a professional. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so why Slate? When did Slate become something that really attracted you? And um, Rachel does have a few photos she's going to share with us because in Scotland, Slate's popular, it's very accessible. So why don't you slip in these pictures so they can see and then we'll talk about why you chose Slate. Okay. Okay, so yeah, let me let me see. We'll try it. Share so bear with us in the screen, screen. Bear with screen. <laughs> while it does something weird. There okay. it is. All right. So I thought I thought I'd just start off with a map to kind of show you guys where I am. This is just a screenshot of of, uh, of Google Maps um, with a little blue dot showing that's that's where in Scotland I'm based in Dunblane. Um, so and that little you see that little blue circle that that's um, around the. Um, there's a little group of islands um, on the west coast there that are called the Slate Islands. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful part of the world. Um, and that's one of the areas where I get slate. But um, slates, you know, there's there's different um, areas of Scotland that have different kinds of slates. Um, so depending where you are, you know, you get very different kinds of slate. But um, so this is this is um, Aberfoyle, which is about 20 minutes down the road from me, um, where we sometimes go hiking. Um, and this is just just an example on on that hike, um, some slate that we that we saw just kind of sitting by the side, um, you know, of the of the trail that we were walking on. So um, so yeah, that that might have gone into my rucksack. Um, and that's that's also some in in Calendar, which is 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 also near near Aberfoyle, um, same kind of area. Um, out hiking with the kids and sending sending one into a stream to fish out a bit that looked quite nice. It's that lovely kind of green colour. Um, so that's the little bit of kind of the foraging that that, that sometimes goes on. Um, this is um, up in the Slate Isles. We took a trip there a couple of years ago now, um, and you know you can get a little a little ferry. This is a little car ferry that you, you know takes maybe two or three cars, maybe four if you're lucky. Um, just across across that little strip of water um, over to the Isle of Ling. Um, and this one's just like, this is like all the, all the beaches, um, you know, all, all the coastline around that area um, looks pretty much like this. Um, and that's all slate there. Um, and yeah, <laughs> not all my slate is forage. So I just thought I'd show you um, a lot of the roofs over here. Um, of, you know, a lot of the houses have got slate roofs, um, so it's not uncommon that um, when somebody I know is having their roof done, you know, people I've, people have got to know that I work with slate. So, um, you know, people say, you know, do you do you want some slate having roof done? So, um, this is just a, a little collection that I got from from somebody local, um, sort of the the ends that they didn't need, and sort of some some scraps in a bucket there. Um, so so yeah so that's that's just my um my 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 few photos of um bits bits and pieces um of, of the slate that that we have kind of around here and, and what i do with um yeah sort of collecting it so and you know again being a mosaic artist it's not like paint you have to pick the heaviest thing ever so as soon as you put that <laughs> picture out there i was like someone's got to lift that up that, <laughs> that's that one light. Car, yeah <laughs> Yep, yeah. transporting it. So, but what is, do you think it was because of your environment where you're living that slate became, or how did the, how did you really become so enamored by it? 
Yeah. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a bit of a mix. I think had I stayed in the States, I definitely, you know, wouldn't have been as much into Slate as I am here. There's definitely that kind of, it's something that's like really accessible and really easy to get hold of. Um, we have other rocks and stones as well, you know, so not just Slate, but, <laughs> right. um, but yeah, I really, what, what I liked about Slate, um, I mean, I like the appearance of it, you know, first of all, that very sort of organic feel to it. Um, you know, but it, it splits really nicely and sort of mm -hmm. cuts really nicely. It's, it's kind of a nice material to kind of work with. Um, I'd seen some work um, both by uh, Doug McInnes, you know, who's a um, mosaic artist who works a lot with Slate, um, Scott Fitzwater, who's is a um, US artist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd seen kind of their work and really, really enjoyed that and thought, you know, I'd like to have a, a play with those materials. So um so yeah when we came back to scotland um i really kind of started focusing on you know how i could could work with that and just kind of challenging myself to see you know, what can this material do you know how how can i use it you know flatten on its edge and at angles and all sorts of things to yes to what do. and and you did study once with dougal but otherwise you pretty much have like kind of created your own style from this material correct yeah, yeah. So I mean, I've done, I've, I did, I did a day workshop with, with, yeah, with Dougal McInnes. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd done a little bit of work with Slate before that. It was really interesting for me to kind of attend his his class and just see kind of his his approach to it as well. Um, but yeah, and I did like like you were saying when we were down in in Santa Barbara, we did um, I did a course with Rachel Sager. You know, just sort of foraging and, and breaking down yeah. materials. So yeah um that was really useful um as well in kind of you know developing my skills and just you know working with the materials that you find um but yeah i think you know a lot of the way i know that i learn is by you know the, the practical you know experimenting and playing and doing and things so yeah i just kind of did a lot and that's of what we love we love to teach our students is just that the practice and the experimenting and giving, you know, teaching the techniques and teaching some of the skills that you've worked really hard at. And that's why we all have become teachers is that we want to share all our hard work of what we've learned and then hope that these students will take it in a direction. And on that note, how and when did you realize that you could teach this um, type of, you know, your style and working with the slate? Um, so I, uh, let's see, I did um, probably a, a year or so after we'd been back, I did an open studio event. Um, and at that point, we would do, like I did it with another artist um, and we, we did some kind of come and have a go kind of sessions just to kind of test the water a little bit and see if people are interested and, um, you know, and, in, in, you know, having a go at, at making the mosaics. Um, and they were really, really popular. And people were asking, oh, do you do workshops at other times? And I'm like, oh, actually, you know, I don't, but I could. Um, so, yeah, I just started out, you know, putting a few dates out there, seeing if people were interested and gradually kind of built up. So um, over like, you know, a couple of years, you know, they, you know, people got to know my work more, you know, people kind of came along. And so that was quite nicely established just before COVID hit um, when then everything everything stopped um yeah but yeah it just kind of built up, up gradually and um and, and I really enjoyed the teaching side of it you know working as an artist um you know it's, it can be very solitary and I you know don't get me wrong I love being on my own <laughs> and doing my own thing and, and making my art um but there, there's I really like the kind of social aspect of the classes and kind of you know supporting people and you know creating whether it's from complete beginner or you know they've already got some of those skills and want to do a bit more um I think you know it's just a really fun thing um to do yeah and you I mean you're in the dictionary under pivot as you took those live <laughs> classes and a little bit of technology between you know your quite large Instagram following which has been amazing to watch over COVID and now past of you sharing, you know, your quick little videos and your luscious uh, mortar that you are <laughs> always mixing that I'm like, oh, that's something I could achieve, I think. Um, uh, but then, you know, let's talk about not only did you pivot to doing uh, the, the Zoom classes and shipping kits and having three kids at home in school. 
It, I mean, seriously, like we all realize, I think in times like this, as much as, you know, we work from home as Jerry and I do, and we have this business, there are so many challenges that come from having to reinvent yourself and constantly being an entrepreneur, a creative entrepreneur. So I think there's something you could share about the challenges and how you stepped up to them and became successful because of it. So you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, there's a lot there, isn't there? <laughs> Um, so yeah, let's start with the, the, well, so the easy one, like the, the pivoting from going to the, um, the in-person classes to the online one, that, that was definitely a challenge to start off with. Um, I remember having conversations with people, you know, after lockdown here and all the classes were canceled and everything. And, um, you know, having conversations, people ask me, you know, are you going to teach online? I'm like, no, I can't do that. You know, it's... <laughs> You know, when people come to my studio, there's like, you know, there's a whole, you know, loads of different boxes of slate. They can choose from different materials. They can choose from to make their pieces. Everybody makes something different. You know, I give them different tools. I was like, I can't do that online. They don't have all that stuff. And, you know, some people can't get hold of slate. And no, I'm not doing it. And, um, yeah, it took, it took me a couple of months or so to kind of just let the cogs kind of turn a little bit and think about whether it might be possible um and then I think it was around June I think we I again I should have had an open studio event then um that you know had been cancelled um and I was like well maybe I could try some kind of dip my toe in the water and try the online thing but it, it was trying to kind of think well you know people might not have tools they might not have the materials what what do I need you know to to make this happen um so yeah I kind of went down putting a kit together um, create a relatively simple design that wouldn't need a lot of cutting um, so that, you know, if people didn't have tools, they could still put it together. So, yeah, people got like a board, some slates, some a little bits of glass um, and some adhesive. Um, and I did a, you know, a little trial with a few people just to see, you know, I was like, how much slate do I need to give them? Because usually, you know, they've got as much as they need in, the, in my studio, whereas, you know, we're kind of like, well, is it about 200 grams? Is it like 100 grams? You know, what, what do we need? Um, so, so yeah, we did that kind of, you know, teething trial process. Um, we had, um, you know, just, just the feedback in terms of even, even the number of students I could teach online, you know, I started off with six and everyone's like, yeah, you could add a few more. So, you know, I, I kind of now take between 10 and 12 um, in a class. And I kind of feel that's plenty, you know, it's enough to, everybody still gets to kind of talk and, be heard but yeah. you know it's not it's not kind of um and you're shipping different. you shipped kits so, all over the world <laughs> yeah i got to know the ladies in the post office really well um so yeah i you know and, and, and i hadn't really grasped that concept that i would be shipping all over the world again at the start you know i kind of thought it would be you know uk um but I got, you know, a lot of a lot of people asking, you know, will you ship to the US? So yeah, we went down went down that route and I shipped to the US, I've shipped to Australia, Singapore, Europe. Um, you know, they've gone all over the place. Um and, and adjusting like the timings of the class to fit with people's time zones and you know <laughs> People don't appreciate it. They have no idea what we do. And I just want to put a really important clause in this right now, as Rachel is talking about shipping kits, there will not be shipping kits for Mosaic Arts Online. It will have to be you resourcing just like all of our Mosaic Arts Online courses, just so that gets out there to all of you that are all of a sudden have yeah. your wheels turning. Oh, Rachel, you sending me my kit. I'm like, no, she's not. Sorry. It's no, gonna be just no, like all the other courses no, out there that you will have to get all your own materials because you're probably going to want to make more and more and more of these um, once you learn her techniques so one kit won't get you very far anyway um so throw in a little bit more now that you've told us all about the challenges of just pivoting you also have three kids at home yes. talk a little bit yes. about what that was like to you know manage everything and your husband's still working um yes yeah, so it's, it's had its challenges let's say um I, you know particularly as i started building up my business um, you know, as I say, as I said before, I've been like a stay, I was stay at home mom for 10 years. So, you know, we kind of used to those kind of roles. Um, and so for me to then start doing something else, there was kind of a shift for, for everybody, really. Um, you know, the kids were older. By by the time I, I we were back here, um, my, my oldest was just starting high school. He was 11 or 12, something like that. And the youngest would have been about... 
uh, how old would he have been? About eight or nine or something. You know, sort of. They were they were old enough. Um, so yeah, the, to start off with, it was just about just me <laughs> adjusting to not having the time to do as much as I wanted to do. Um, you know, I basically had the time while they were at school, and then after that, it was everything else. Um, and it and it continues sometimes to be a challenge. That you know, they're all older now. They're all after this summer. They're all going to be at high school. Um, but there is still that challenge, like, right, who's going to do the grocery shopping and who's going to, you know, get all the laundry done and things like that. You know, there's still all those things that are still kind of balancing as, as those roles adjust. Um, but yeah, during lockdown, it was it was just a different challenge again um, because they were, all, they were all at home all the time um, and they were meant to be doing stuff for school and nobody really wanted to. And, you know, it was... It was just horrible, really. Um, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> let's be honest. It was rubbish. Um, and yeah, I remember I would go from like one child to the other child. You know, what's what work are you meant to be doing today, and what work, and having the same battles of like, you know, nobody's motivated, nobody wants to do anything, and then just coming out and just going, oh god. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was it was challenging, but um, I think for my sanity, I need space to kind of you know to you know creating something is you know a therapeutic thing as well you know we we all know you know it's a you, when you get in the get in you know when you're making it and you're kind of in the flow then that's that's really nice so um you know I kind of made sure I had some time to to create and um and yeah just gadgets you know are really really good you know iPads mm -hmm. and computers and <laughs> you know you do feel like you know th there is that there's always that balance of you know, being a good mum and you know trying to run your own business and and you know it is it is a balancing act um and you know there are times where they've just like watch movies all afternoon or something just so like, get off doing stuff and I'm like you know it's, but you know well, you, you do what you do to get through and you know we've done lots of nice things as well so it's just it is a balance though it is a, a juggling act and it's and it's always there there's always something you know they all go to school and then somebody somebody's ill or somebody needs something and you know it's always something that has to kind of be flexible and, and things. yeah but, um, and I think I mean that's what I kind of thought it would be great for you to share is exactly that that you have managed to not only figure out that balance act but do it successfully and you know you're growing and growing and now what's so exciting is on top of all of that she just shared she actually found quiet time and a space during covid to shoot her own course which the footage is absolutely <laughs> gorgeous and rachel and i actually started the conversation at the society of american mosaic art virtual conference in the beginning of February. We kind of hit off in like a private chat room that was available on the platform, better known as like the water cooler. If we had been in a working place, we were having a conversation where amazing things just come to light. Like she could do this from Scotland and we don't really, um, like to do, you know, remote courses because we'd rather, you know, everyone be here in the studio. But we've had success with Caitlin um, Hepworth and Carla Duderlow and now Rachel. So it's really exciting. So why don't you share a little bit about the reason you chose to do the type of course you're doing of giving these many different um, techniques and kind of designs? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we, we talked a bit about, you know, different kind of there's so many different options that you could do with Slate. Like the kits that we that I was doing was like, you know, you are making this specific thing. Um, but I wanted to give people more the the skills so that they could kind of go on and, and do do their own thing as well. Um, and when I was was you know starting out with working with Slate, what I found was really useful was to kind of experiment with it and see what it could do. Um, it's a really good way of learning sort of to to play with it and try it in different ways and so that's why like in in the course what i do is show you the different techniques i show you well if we start off we start you know breaking up the slate and just some of the techniques for you know breaking it into manageable pieces um but then also um you know the different techniques for kind of working with it with the you know with the adhesive and the different angles and things that you can you know to lay it um and then we kind of look at creating this sampler um piece so that you can try the different ways and different ways of combining it with small t and the different effects that you can get so so you build up those different skills and that you know those thought processes um 
to be able to then go and make a bigger piece, whether it's a, a bigger version of something that you've done in a sample or whether it's combining some of those techniques. Um, but just to have that, yeah, that variety of different skills to, to put together um, was kind of the, the, the thinking behind it. And I know that I've got, like in my studio, I've got kind of got sampler pieces that I've made that when I'm working, I'm like, you know, I want to do something there, but, you know, what can I do? To look back on something I find is really useful to have that there to kind of go, oh, yeah, I could do it like that. Or, you know, that was quite a nice effect. So that, um, that right there so, is yeah. such a good teaching tool on all levels. And I try um, you, Kelly, Rachel, a lot of us try and um, share that, you know, Annabella does it in her courses about having these um sample boards, whether it is in practice of your Tessera or it is in grout or if it's in thin set colors, Caitlin does, you know, that with her sculptural course. It's so important and it's so great to have. It's such a resource that you can just look in your studio and be like, hey, oh, I did it that way and it worked or I didn't like it instead of it exploding onto your whole substrate and you're hating it or it is amazing, yeah. but you didn't expect it to be amazing and which is always good, of course. So, um, so you teaching just even it's like a two-parter in the sense that people can learn how these sample boards can be so beneficial and they're learning seven different methods of how you can break the slate and um, use it uh, to create the different ways. And really quickly, we do have one question, someone asking if there is good slate resources in the States, in the United States. And yes, there are. We have one specific one that is in the resource guide you will get if you do the course, as well as you can go to landscaping, roofing, and um, tile stores, and they usually can get it for you. And then Rachel shows you um, different types of slate and how to cut them and cleave them even from the States. She specifically got slate from this one company and uses it in the course so that people can have a range depending on where they live. So that's available. Um, so there's not um, much more that I felt we had to cover, except for I did want to talk about the two pieces that are behind you. And if you want to just share a little bit about this, because I know people are probably curious, especially the one behind your right shoulder, a little bit about that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my interwoven piece. Um, I think that that was a very experimental piece um at the time um we were having um so in, in scotland um we were organizing an exhibition in the borders which has kind of a really strong history of kind of textiles um and and weaving and um so i wanted to make a piece to kind of to, to reflect that um so and, and i've got an interest um in sort of weaving in general as well and sort of textiles um i've done some sort of spinning and weaving and sort of textile stuff and i and kind of had that interest in how I can take something from the weaving and things that I've done and transfer it to to mosaic and it's like well can can you weave mosaic can you know because you're you know weaving's very soft whereas mosaic's very hard um so so yeah it was a bit of an experiment so what I did was I made um lots of strips um you know sort of using mesh and, and adhesive I made these these strips and I made them undulating um, and they've got quite deep curves um, so yeah I made made a whole load of those because when when you weave that's what the fab you know the 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 yarn the, is doing it's it's kind of going up and down so I made those strips to kind of correspond with that um, and yeah I made made a whole load of them um, and then individually mosaiced all of those pieces um, and I've done them with slates and I've done them with then, um, I don't know how well you guys can see that, but it's got each, each strip has um, a color of small tea that kind of is woven through that, that individual strip as well. Um, so yeah, I did, I did the, you know, all the strips, make them all. let's really hope it works it hadn't worked they would all you know they did look quite nice all as just strips so I was like that's my backup plan um but they did it you know they because I'd left that enough you know quite deep um you know deep curves undulations um there was enough kind of giving them that I could kind of weave them all together so they were all kind of woven together and then it was a case of like picking up a a anywhere there was contact with the board um, sort of picking that up and, um, you know, gluing that bit down um, to the board. So then it was, you know, stuck to stuck to the board. Um, 
so yeah that's that's um make that's that's how that one was made um and then um the the one on my the one on my left um was one made again sort of a little bit earlier on when i was still sort of experimenting with different kinds of slate i was kind of making my own substrate um and again just playing about with the different ways that you can lay i'm just see if i can show you that one a bit closer it's a lot easier to pick up than the other one um <laughs> but yeah just so, so you get a bit of a, a a clearer view of it um you know all, all this brown slate is the is the Eastdale slate that um you know i showed you the the islands where where it came from um and yeah that was just i really wanted to kind of do see if i can put it back down um yeah, a circular piece and just, again, play, playing with the lines and the different um, the different textures, the different materials and how they could all be kind of combined together, um, yeah, to create that. So, um, yeah, that's one of the, my, my ones that I keep. That one's not for sale. That's one that stays with me. It has um, to. And yeah. on that note, speaking of your work, um, you just recently finished a piece with Helen Miles as well yep. that is going to the ruins, Rachel Sager's Living Mosaic M Museum, I call it. And why don't you share, and you have a couple pictures, uh, it's going in the yeah. map room. It's yeah. The map room is where certain artists have been chosen by Rachel Sager to create their country, I guess is the way to say it. Um, yeah. And it is being installed there hopefully next week. We have had um, Caitlin Hepworth and Marion Shapiro do Australia. And I'm not going to pretend to know anybody else right now, except you guys <laughs> off the top <laughs> of my head. So why don't you show us a couple pictures of what is literally in transit right now to um, the ruins in Whitsitt, Pennsylvania. Okay, let me... See if we can share this again. Okay, so this is this is Scotland. This is this is finished. Um, so yeah, we've got mainland Scotland. We've got the islands um, off to the side. We've got Orkney and Shetland. So Shetland should actually, when it's installed, Shetland's going to be further north. But we needed to kind of shiggle it down um, <laughs> so we could get it all in the picture. Shetland's um, the Shetland Isles are really quite far north. Um, so so yeah, that's that's the the finished piece. Um, and yeah, it's made made with with slate mainly, um, and then all the the reds um, are various different materials. Um, there's there's stone, um, there's pigmented adhesive, um, there's a bit of glass in there. So various different types of stones as well that we've used. And then the the whole coast is. Um, there's there's some shells and sort of things gathered from the beaches. You know, sort of. Um, bits of you know china and and things that have been picked upon on beaches um and there's some marble in there as well so there's lots of kind of different materials that that we've used for those kind of different sections um and i'll just show you a wee close up as well um just so you can see a bit of the detail um of that just to, you know it has got that um I, I don't work flat it has you know there's there's that sort of textural element um to it you know with all the the slates up on its edges um and this is the Easdale slate um mainly um in this bottom half that that we've been using um so so yeah that's that's currently um in transit um on on its way to the ruins um and yeah, I mean the 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 design. It's been a long time coming <laughs> that that piece. Um, you know, we we started planning it for it kind of pre-COVID, um, but and yeah, and the the plan was that we would collaborate on it together. So we would be kind of you know meeting either working on it together or exchanging pieces and and going backwards and forwards. Um, but restrictions just meant that it was it was really hard to do that. So you know, for a long time, it's just kind of sat in my studio waiting for Helen, and then Helen's had it and waiting for me, and um, and then we were due to get together to put it, you know. And then I think my son had to isolate because you know of COVID, and you know there were just different things that kind of happened along the way that that meant that you know when, when we met up this week and we got everything finished and we got it packed up, we're like yeah. You know, it's, it's finally done. It kind of couldn't quite believe because it's been such a long time coming. Well, um, 
Yeah, I know it's just been funny that when you and I started this conversation about doing the live, it was written in our outline that, well, tell us what you're working on. And in the meantime <laughs> of this last week, it has now become completed and being shipped. And someone's asking um, how big it is. Can you give a rough estimate in inches or metric oh, or, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> or just right. an estimate it doesn't have to be exact i know it's a funny yeah, shape so anyway. it's probably about someone asked me the other day in inches it's in terms of height of mainland scotland it's pro it's it's no more than 48 inches and i know that because the boards that we used when we were packing were like 24 inches so there was like the top part and the bottom part so no more than 48 inches um tall um roughly um so yeah um and yeah i mean the, the the design you know is is based on the the highland clearances in scotland so there was a period um of time where um a lot of um people were cleared from their crofts in order to make space to for for people to um you know graze sheep and things instead um so all those red areas where you know in fact, Helen did all the kind of the red bits, um, are kind of all areas of Scotland where people had been kind of cleared from from the land. Um, and initially, some of them went to the coast um, and then some of them emigrated as well. Um, so, yeah, we wanted to kind of base the, the mosaic in kind of history. Um, and it, it's one of those pieces that evolved. You know, initially it was going to be, you know, some of the, the slate work was going to reflect the kind of the geology of Scotland. Obviously we've got kind of a lot of, you know, sort of different mountain ranges and, and hills and things. Um, and yeah, that that design kind of evolved as well as, as we went along using the, depending on how, you know, I could respond to what Helen had done and how she could respond to what I'd done. You know, it was a really interesting project to work on, just sort of working with with somebody else. Um, and yeah, that was, it was, it's been a lot of fun. Yes, and we cannot wait to see it once it is installed. And on that note, Rachel Sager, we will be doing a live 2021, 2021 year ruins tour with her in August. So everyone stay tuned for that as Scotland will be installed in the map room and Rachel will be focusing more on the, yeah, Rachel Sager will be focusing more on the map room and the bird installation and a few other things that maybe you didn't see last year when she did her 2020 tour. So everyone stay tuned for that excitement. So Rachel, you have a couple of questions coming in from our viewers. And one of them is asked, do you ever use found objects and vintage pieces to add Add into your artwork um sometimes yeah i mean if if there's something that i find that i think that's that's really cool i'd like to add that in then um yeah i'm i'm happy to kind of add in you know and anything that kind of works or fits with a design and i've got you know i've got bits and pieces that i've found that I go that would be really cool to add into something and haven't quite used yet but you know um yeah i'm open to to you know although although i work mainly in slate I'm not, you know, it's not a strict, it has to have slate or, you know, that's it. Um, you know, it's it's always good to kind of include and work with other things as well. Cause you know, e each different material has its own, its own properties, responds in different ways, works in different ways. So I think it's good to use that variety just to, um, yeah, keep your skills up as well. Well, and it also is a way that some people maybe can create their own style and their own version. Again, that goes back to experimenting and practicing. You know, maybe Rachel doesn't do it, but why not try it and see what you get with, you know, yeah. the skills Rachel teaches in using Slate. And then you have some amazing found object or a vintage piece and you want to add to it. You know, voila, you've now created your own version learning from Rachel and doing your own, you know, creative experience. So and I, and, and when I taught, so when I, when I taught, no. you know, teaching the, the kit classes even, people do add in one of the things I loved about, you know, people add in their own bits and pieces. Anyway, everybody's, I think the lovely thing about working with like organic materials, whether it's slate or rock, you know, they're accessible to everybody and everybody's like, Oh, I found this bit on the beach. I found, you know, materials have got stories. Um, and, you know, people would always add in, you know, different bits and pieces to their slate mosaics and, you know, make them their own, which is, you know, a really lovely thing to do. That's awesome. And it, it is. It's exactly right. Someone's asking a little bit about the tools and you could maybe like just lightly go over the fact that they this person asking says, do you strictly use Hammer and Hardy or do you use nippers? So give them a little insight into what is involved with the slate and how the hammer and the Hardy not necessary. 
yeah, no, you, with with the sleigh, the hammer and hardy are definitely not necessary. Um, you do need a hammer, but not a traditional mosaic hammer. Just like, I mean, the hammer that I have is the one that I found in our toolbox that we use, like, you know, for putting up um, pitch hooks and things on the wall. It's got a flat, flat head. Um, and yeah, that I I have a, a portable, you know, one of the metal hardies and it's pure. I, I don't use it like it should be used. Um, I just use it to bash the slate off. Um, and for those of you that follow me on Instagram, um, you may have even seen some videos of, of me doing that. Um, but I also talk about the course. You don't need even need the hardy. You can use a brick or something as well. So there are, you know, you don't need those specialist like hammer and hardy tools for slate. It doesn't really cut with a hammer and hardy particularly well. Um, and yeah, go in and, and, the, and in the course I'll show you, you know, I'll, I'll demo some of those techniques that I use for breaking it up. And then, you know, we do use different hand tools as well. I use kind of wheeled nippers and side biter nippers, you know, tools that I had before I started working with slate. Um, they aren't specialist slate tools. Um, they're ones that I had that kind of found ways of using them and working with them um, for, for breaking the slate. So there's no particular, you know, specialist slate tools. It's using the tools that as a mosaic artist that you will probably have already. Yeah, and that's kind of the beauty of this course. It, it really is great for people that are already, you know, inclined to use nippers and inclined to use um, the side biters and things that are, you know, probably in your studio. Someone's asking if you have more pictures, which I know you don't, but do you work with ever making flowers or landscapes or is it mostly you're sticking in the slate sort of? So, I, I mean, <laughs> just to say the flowers and the landscapes, they're, they're Personally, I've done a few landscape piece, um, pieces. Um, one of the techniques that I use with the slate that, that we don't cover in this class, but I, I use the, the wet tile sort to cut up slate sometimes. Um, and some of the strips that you get off that, you get nice pieces that look a bit like mountains. So I've kind of used those in creating kind of some, some landscape pieces. Um, but usually I tend to work more abstract. Um, I tend not to um, create things that look specifically like things. Um, but having said that, um, going back to the, the teaching that I've been doing on Zoom, um, I do a land, I did a, you know, a landscape course um, where we put bits, you know, use slate to make, you know, sort of a landscape, different types of slate to, to make a landscape. Um, and we did a, a slate flowers course where we use the slate to kind of create flowers as well. So it's, you know, it is possible to create more realistic things using the slate. And I've seen other artists do that. Um, but personally, I really kind of like the more abstract, um, flowing kind of designs rather than trying to, um, yeah, make something look like something. An image. <laughs> I like exactly. how that flexibility mm -hmm. looks like what, what it looks like in my head rather than what, you know, people want to see. So. Well, and, and that leads to our next question where someone did ask, do you draw your design first or do you kind of just freehand? So I do, I don't do a lot of drawing. Um, a lot, I get that's quite a lot. Um, I do what I could kind of sketching on the on the board. So I'll kind of take my materials and I'll kind of lay them out on the board, kind of how I think I might want them to look. And I'll maybe lay down kind of strips of materials as to where I think they might want to go. So I kind of do my sketching that way rather than paper and pencil or anything. OK, I mean, sometimes I do, you know, I might have an idea and think, oh, it will look roughly like that. Um, I get really impatient when I try and do it that way. I find it, and I find it hard to kind of go from a paper and pencil design to a, you know, more dimensional piece of work. So I find it easier to lay, you know, the kind of the, what called like the bones of the piece, the, the rough structure of the piece. I lay that down and, you know, sketch with those materials that I'm going to be working with because it helps me see, you know, what colors will go together or what, you know, materials work together and, and how they might look more than just drawing them out. Um, and I take photos of that, you know, to refer back to and things as well. So that's kind of more, more my process. And, and I don't like, you know, to have too rigid a design either, because as you stick things down, things change. And so, yeah, there is that kind of going with the flow type of, of thing as well. There's that kind of broad overall, I want it to look roughly like this. And then, you know, sort of working with the materials as I go, sort of depending and the th you know, the thing with slate as well, it, it's not a material you can cut precisely. You know, it's not like a stained glass where you can grind it to the exact, you know, shape. You you kind of have to go with how it wants to cut and the, the shapes that you get. So you 
you have to be kind of a little bit flexible in that way as well. Yeah, and there is something uh, pretty magical about creating something out of nothing. And that kind of comes from that flow of you have an idea in your head, you kind of put down your dry laying where you think you're going, and then you do get into that zone. And all of a sudden, you know, you wake up and you're like, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is pretty magical. And um, I can appreciate that. Someone's asking if you can use slate as a substrate. Um, you can. I don't. Um, it's not the kind of style of, of mosaic that I make. But yeah, definitely a lot of people, you know, you know, particularly it's, it's, it's quite popular for the garden. You got a lot of um, artists, particularly, you know, over here in the UK, will use slates, you know, as a substrate and, and do their design onto the onto the slate. Um, you, you obviously you, your slate's heavy. So if you're using slate as a substrate, it's going to be heavy. Um, so, you know, it's, it's better if you're just doing kind of smaller things on that because you have to think about where it's going and whether you're hanging it and things but um but yeah it can be used as a substrate but not i tend to use it as a tessera rather than the, the substrate so if anyone else has any other questions or comments they want to throw into the chat now that would be great and in the meantime i think we're going to uh announce our little bonus section as you have all been with us for a lovely 45 minutes so informative rachel so inspiring thank you so much for doing this with us and for everyone else that was able to get on live at wherever you are in the world because i know time zones are just you know they're not just all here at 11 a.m. in California. <laughs> so if you can see this, hopefully you can, but Jerry will also put it in the um, chat, but we're offering 15% off this course. We are launching right now and it will be, it says midnight Saturday, but that means for California because that's pretty much all I can um, compute right now. <laughs> so if you are in Rachel's world, this actually goes through Sunday. So whatever place in the world you are, you can get 15% off with Slate 15 at the course that is now available at Mosaic Arts Online. And if you are seeing this, write it down because I'm about to move it. And otherwise, it'll be in the chat and available. So if we don't have any other questions, do we have any other questions? Um, how did you attach your slate to the mesh for the weaving? Uh, one more question. How did you attach the slate to the mesh for the weaving piece? Um, so, so the, the weaving piece, they were like, it was like the, the sub, I made the substrate. So the, 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 I used several layers of mesh, um, to create the substrate. And then I just mosaiced onto those, onto that as a substrate. So, um, in the normal way that you were, you know, just using thin sets, tile adhesive, just sticking those pieces onto the that undulating. So the yeah, it wasn't it wasn't mesh in the way that you would, you know, put it on just like one layer of mesh and then stick it on something. It was a it was a solid substrate that I've made using mesh and tile adhesive. So um, yeah, then just mosaicing it on the, the the usual kind of way. And we, in the course and in the intro that everyone can see, we call it our promo video. You can click on that before you decide to purchase it. And what it does is it has some um, sneak peek and snippets into the course. So you can see actually Rachel working and different parts about what she explains that she teaches in the course. You can now watch and see that before you decide, you know, if you want to purchase this course or not. And one other question someone asks is like, how thin can you make the slate and what substrates do you create on? So why don't we wrap it up with that last question? Okay. So it, it, how thin the slate can go really depends on the kind of slate. So some, some are harder and some are softer than others. Uh, but slate can go really thin. You can get really kind of really slithers of slate uh, depending on, you know, what, what kind of you're working with. Um, so, yeah, it can. You can use it quite chunky. You can use it really, really thin. Um, if you, when, when it goes really thin, you know, it, it becomes a lot more vulnerable, very, very fragile. So, you know, there is a point where you, you don't want to use too thin stuff in, in your mosaic, but yeah, it can go pretty thin. Um, and so what was the other part you... The substrate. What substrate do you like to work on? Um, so I, I kind of use two main substrates. Um, first the one that, and, and that one that I teach for, for my students is kind of jacker board, which is like weedy boards. I think it's, it's, it's more common in the States, but that compressed foam core, like Marmox, I think is another brand. 
um, you know, that has the, the compressed foam core because it's really lightweight um, and slates heavy. So I, um, I do some of my work on, on that. Um, and the other substrate I tend to use is kind of my own handmade substrate that's sort of made with those kind of layers of mesh and things that just have that little bit more kind of dimension to them sometimes. Um, but again, that are really strong and, and relatively lightweight. Um, so that's, and, that's the two things I usually use, yeah. Yeah, and so Rachel teaches how to wrap the edges of her Jacka board, which is just like Weddy board. It is the compressed extruded foam that has the cementitious mesh on both sides. So she does teach how to wrap those edges. And so you do have a really beautiful continuity um, around the edges when the piece is finished of the sampler she makes. If you are interested in more substrates and the other one she's talking about, which is the mesh and thin set, we do have another course at Mosaic Arts Online called Substrates Every everything you need to know and how to create them by yours truly. And that is a great course if you wanna learn all different ways to use different kinds of substrates so that you can be more versatile uh, in your work. And the other thing you might wanna check out at Mosaic Arts Online that is free is Rachel Sager has a tutorial on the difference between slate and shale. And we really didn't get into that today because Rachel works you know, predominantly in slate and in the States, Rachel Sager is known for working in her shale and she gets a lot of it uh, from the river where she lives really close to and she sells the shale. So just so we all understand, there are totally two different materials, slate and shale, and you can learn more about the difference between them at that free tutorial on Mosaic Arts Online. So on that note, Rachel, unless you have something else to share, I would like to thank you very much for joining us in this live um, you know, event while we are all living our lives and <laughs> doing what we can do. And some of us are getting out to workshops and retreats and still learning online. And it's just been a pleasure to have you here and learn more and more about your process and you and what it's been like this last year. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's been lovely to just just have a chat. And um, yeah, I hope everybody has, has enjoyed listening. And um, and yeah, if interested in, in learning more about Slate, then yeah, take the course and um, and share what you make as well, because I always love seeing what people make. So um, yeah. Yes, we definitely would love you to share what you make. And um, we are really excited that this course is now live at Mosaic Arts Online. Again, you can get the Slate 15 discount for the next, you know, 30 hours or so. And um, otherwise, it will be 10% off. If you have not joined Mosaic Arts Online, you could do so for free. But all of our courses do launch with a 10% discount. But because you came here to our YouTube channel and hung out with us with Rachel uh, and learning more about her, you get an extra 5% off. So if you grab that in the next 30 hours, great. Otherwise, it will be 10% off uh, for the next 10 days um, for our traditional launch period. And um, I'm so excited for this course. This is something many people have been asking about. It's way more elaborate than what you taught, I know, in your uh, Zoom classes. So people get so much more information and um, it's something they can always have and refer back to and you know it's once you purchase our courses they never expire and um, they are a beautiful way to learn because nothing's committed to memory and you could just refer back to you know section after section and it's like having Rachel with you 24 <laughs> 7. <laughs> so thank you everyone and we'll see you hopefully next month with uh, Rachel Sager's Ruins Tour. Brilliant. Bye. Thank you. Bye.